Lecture 21, Dynamic Memory Allocation. Well, yeah. I also thought about making this um, Arnold from the, uh, from the first Terminator movie saying, you know, your RAM, give it to me. But this works too. Um, okay, you're probably at this point familiar with dynamic memory allocation from the perspective of writing an application that's going to use memory, right? You will um, necessarily need to request the memory that you're looking for. In something like Java, you use just the new keyword to allocate something and then the uh, JVM runtime will come and garbage collect it when it's no longer needed. So that's convenient. Um, in C++, we have the new and the delete operators to allocate and deallocate memory. These invoke a constructor and destructor respectively. Um, and uh, we are responsible in, say, C++ for choosing when to deallocate the memory ourselves. There is no runtime system that's going to come and do it for us. Um, but in C, um, when we want some memory, we just allocate it with malloc and we deallocate it with free. Uh, and this level is much closer to the way that the operating system actually thinks about memory, um, which is tell me how much memory you need and let me know when you're finished with it. It's not really concerned with you know, running constructors and figuring out what to do and filling in uh, this or that and destructors. It's, it's really just about is this memory in use? Yes or no. Um, so yeah, this should sort of square nicely with our experience, if you will, um, with allocating memory in C. Um, that when we um, want to allocate something, right, we're going to, well, allocate it, right? Um, we say uh, we want malloc size of int, um, and it creates somewhere in memory, um, you know, some, <laughs> it, well, it doesn't really create in memory the integer, right? Um, but it allocates memory for the size that we've requested. Let's imagine an integer is four bytes in our system, although it doesn't have to be. Um, and that's going to um, be assigned, if you will, to our program. Um, and it returns the address. The address is stored in a pointer, presumably an integer pointer, but you can store it in a void pointer or something else if you want. Um, and to make sure that we request and receive the correct amount of memory, um, we have the size of operator, which works out the size of its argument, the integer type. Uh, and then it's supplied to malloc. And if you take a look at you know, some of the work that the compiler does, we'll see that uh, you know, it figures out in some cases um, that the you know, size of here refers to uh, the size of an integer and it just replaces it with four. Uh, if four bytes is the correct size for our, um, for our program. So that's convenient, um, but okay. So memory is allocated uh, and when we call free on that pointer all that happens is the memory there is marked as available which is why you can sometimes get away as SimCity once did uh, with dereferencing a pointer after, it after it's been freed. Sometimes it takes a while for the memory to be reclaimed or reused so the old value just kind of happens to sit there in memory for a while so you can kind of get away with it um, and you'll notice that free doesn't specify how much memory is being returned this implies a couple of things um, and um, yeah I mean sometimes we can get away with dereferencing it um, and uh, no wait that's illegal HD me um, but if um, free does not specify how much memory is being returned uh, it's indication that number one the operating system is responsible for keeping track of each blocks size when it is allocated uh, and number two there isn't really a way to just return a part of a block you can't say oh, you know, I want to deallocate half of the memory that I have allocated with the preliminaries out of the way um, it's time for us to turn our focus uh, from the point of view of the operating system towards how do we actually fulfill a request, right? Um, the operating system has to find some memory to meet the request. It's not a trivial problem. <laughs> we're, uh, we're now in you know, the second topic about memory and uh, you know, there's, there's lots to talk about here. This is not just a hypothetical um, concern or history lesson. Uh, and although running out of memory is pretty rare in a modern computer, um, it is possible that for whatever reason, you know, the request that we're looking for cannot be fulfilled just because, well, there's no block that's available um, that, that matches the requirement. 
right? You can think of this as being like at a restaurant, you know, if you want a table for 10 people, there has to be a table that accommodates 10 people available. It doesn't matter if there are 10 seats total available because, you know, there's two tables of, uh, of four and, and a couple of tables of two that are available. So, you know, there's 12 seats that are available, but if you want a table for 10, you have to be able to find 10 seats altogether at the same table, just as an analogy. Okay, um, so let us consider arranging the blocks. One possibility that we will consider here is fixed block sizes. Um, and um, all the blocks of memory that are allocated are the same size. Um, this doesn't mean that requests are always the same size. It just means that you know, all blocks that are allocated are the same size. Um, so if we get a request for one byte, well, we'll give them one block. If the request is larger than that, you know, it would be the equivalent of 1.5 blocks. Well, we'll give them two blocks. Okay. Will it work? To some extent. Um, it's immediately obvious that it's kind of wasteful, right? If you requested, you know, you want to allocate eight bytes because you want to store a double type and we give you a whole block. If a block is large, we've just wasted a whole bunch of space, right? If a block is one kilobyte and we ask for eight bytes, you know, boy, that's, that's a lot of space that's wasted, isn't it? Um, it's not totally crazy, right? Um, it, <laughs> the amount of wasted memory maybe isn't too big. Um, but this is what we would call internal fragmentation, right? Um, the space here that's inside of an allocated block that cannot be used for anything is wasted. Uh, it shows up as allocated even though we're not using it. Uh, and so that results in, well, internal fragmentation. Um, this obviously is going to occur when block sizes are fixed, uh, and the bigger each block is, the more memory is wasted. If a block is 32 bytes uh, and you know, we asked for 8, well, we only wasted 24 bytes. Uh, if a block is 3 kilobytes and we asked for 8 bytes, we've wasted quite a lot more memory. So we don't like that. Um, and in the initial version, the system has only one size of blocks. Let's imagine it's one kilobyte, so 1,024 bytes, just for the sake of putting a, a nice round number on things. Um, and to implement this strategy, we just take all of our main memory and we divide it into blocks of fixed size and we maintain a linked list uh, of all of the addresses of all of the currently available blocks. Okay, and when you need some, you take them out of the list and so, assign them, right? Right? Yeah, so if a block of memory is being marked as allocated, we remove its corresponding node from the list. When the block is freed, we put a node with that address into the linked list saying, okay, it's available now. If the list is empty, um, then, well, memory request can't be satisfied, so we'll return null, right? There's no memory available, uh, or if there's not enough memory available for the request, we have to say no, and we do so by returning null. Okay, it's fast. You know, our worst case memory allocation is you know, basically constant time. Um, we're, you know, we could imagine um, we could imagine linear characteristics depending on our implementation, but that's not bad overall. Okay, but fixed block sizes, as you would imagine, really have a problem with internal fragmentation. Maybe you don't care. Um, maybe you have a system where it doesn't really matter. Um, this, this may be suitable actually for uh, an embedded system where you just want operations to be as simple and as fast as possible uh, and it is basically irrelevant uh, how efficient the scheme is in terms of like using up memory. Um, you don't care about wasting it, you just want to be able to it'll always get a block of memory in a fixed amount of time. Maybe that's fine. But I think we know in real life that that's kind of not how it works. Um, when you work with a language like C, if you want to malloc you know, a four byte integer, um, somehow you're not increasing the size of allocated memory for your process by, uh, by one kilobyte every time. Um, what we're actually interested in is variable block size. Um, and realistically, um, variable block sizes makes more sense. Um, and this also recognizes the fact that, well, different memory allocations are frequently you know, different sizes, right? You know, requesting a small amount of memory is pretty common, uh, but requesting larger amounts of memory is not unheard of either. 
So let's say that we have several different block sizes, right? Um, in, in the limit, we could you know, take it down to um, the size of block is the smallest uh, unit that can be addressed in memory. So that might be at one byte if you have byte addressable memory. But let's start with um, one, two, and four kilobyte sizes, let's say. All right, and we have different linked lists for um, different blocks, and that might actually help. Um, so, yeah, um, variable block sizes give us a bit more of what we're looking for here. Um, but we've come across a different problem, and that's keeping track of what's allocated and what is free. Um, and there's a couple of different strategies that are interesting to talk about, um, but there's uh, inevitably some headaches associated with each of these. First option is a bitmap. So we divide memory into you know, capital M units of N lowercase bits, uh, and then to create a bit array of size M, capital M, storing the status of each of those little units, um, say zero if it's free and one if it's allocated. Uh, and if a bit uh, is zero, uh, that tells us it's unallocated. So it's easy by looking at the bitmap. Um, so how much memory do we lose uh, in this overhead? Well, it's 100 divided by n plus one in parentheses percent. Uh, of the memory is used. So if a unit is four bytes, the bitmap is about 3% of memory. If it's 16 bytes, then the bitmap takes about 0.8% of memory. So yeah, losing one or 3% or to overhead, that's probably okay. We're probably comfortable with that overall. Um, it's, it's somewhat workable. If you want to find a large block of memory um, for, you know, for a block of k bytes, then you need to find you know, a bitmap for a run of 8k divided by n uh, zeros. Um, and of course, if we choose something like um, 8 as, as a size, um, then the math is actually even easier <laughs> um, because, well, 8 and n will cancel out, so we just need to find k zeros um, in there. Okay. Um, that works. There's also, of course, the linked list approach, uh, and the linked list can work just as you would expect. Um, the info from the linked list can be stored separately from memory allocation, or it can be stored as a part of the block of memory. So when you ask for a memory request, we might store some information, say, just before the memory that was allocated um, that specifies, hey, the following block is you know, allocated as 128 bytes. Um, and that might actually work. Right. So if we do the linked list approach, right, um, at the start, we have one entry and all available memory is in this one big block. Uh, and when a memory request is allocated, we need to divide up that big block to accommodate the request. Um, suppose we allocate the first 128 bytes. We'll talk about some different strategies for, for how to do this in a minute. Um, but let's say that that's what we're going to do. All right, a new entry is placed in the list at 128 bytes. It's marked as busy in use. Uh, it's allocated. Um, and then the entry in the linked list contains the start address, the length of the block, and information about whether it's currently allocated or not. Uh, and then the unallocated blocks node contains the updated entry. It has a smaller size. It has a new start address. And the bit says it is unallocated. When a block is deallocated, we simply find the block in the linked list and sets the allocated bit to zero to indicate it's available again. Now in a typical system, there will be a lot of allocation and deallocation of memory, which potentially leads to breaking up memory into smaller pieces where we end up with free blocks that are both small and spread out as we see here. Uh, and this is sometimes referred to as a checkerboard situation. Um, and it may be that there is in fact a contiguous block of memory of size n. If we look in this diagram, say towards the end, there's a, a, uh, an unallocated block that consists of four smaller pieces. Um, but a request for that space cannot be fulfilled because the memory is split up, but only in the logical like, ah, yeah, we consider these to be different sections because at one point they were separated kind of sense. Um, and to solve that, we need a way to recombine the split blocks, which is called coalescence. Uh, and if we do that, it just you know, eliminates the dividers between adjacent unallocated blocks to make larger unallocated blocks instead. 
And coalescence is a fancy sounding word, um, but it's really just the process of merging you know, two or more adjacent free blocks into one larger one, um, because dividing memory should be a reversible operation. Uh, and this does solve the problem of having potentially n contiguous bytes being unable to be allocated. Um, and coalescence is one of those things that's kind of a maintenance task. We could do it periodically. We could do it whenever a block of memory is freed um, by checking around, you know, hey, should I combine this with you know, its neighbors? Um, if the answer to that is yes, then sure, by all means, go ahead. Um, if the answer is no, then don't change anything. So that's a potential option, or we can sweep memory periodically, also good. Um, coalescence, if we do intend to do this, does make sense to, um, to maintain memory in a doubly linked list, um, and that makes it a little easier to check our neighbors on each side uh, when a block of memory is deallocated uh, to make a determination about whether we should um, coalesce it with those neighbors. If we only have the next pointer, it's a little bit harder. Uh, to uh, identify you know, if we should coalesce it with something that's before it in the memory allocation order. But you can, right? There are ways. Um, even with coalescence, there is the distinct possibility that um, n free bytes exist in the system, but it's spread out over many little pieces. Um, and this potentially happens, as I said in an earlier example, where we talked about there's a... Um, restaurant and you're trying to find you know, enough seating for a group of 10 and there's enough seats total but not in a group right you you want there to be a group of seats all together and we don't have that uh, and when free memory is spread up into tiny little fragments that are not marked as allocated but they're too small to be useful well we call that external fragmentation and it is analogous to the internal fragmentation, but of course, instead of being inside an allocated block, now it is outside of any allocated block. Um, but whatever we do, right, like we have this problem where we have these little tiny you know, bits of, uh, of memory that we can't really use. So one way to reduce the external fragmentation is actually by increasing internal fragmentation. Um, and that is basically like rounding up the size of memory allocations. Um, when you get a request for n bytes, and if there's you know, n plus k available, um, assuming k is, is fairly small, you just allocate the whole block. You don't subdivide it, you know, leaving 12 bytes over. Um, there's no reason to make your life difficult like that. Um, you can just you know, throw it all in there together, or you round it up to the nearest you know, power of two something like that, um, we just accept in that case that um, these bytes are lost uh, to internal fragmentation. So here again, an, an example, uh, if a free block contains 128 bytes and the request is 120, it's probably not worth the hassle and the overhead to split this into a block of 120 and a block of eight. Uh, what you'll do instead is just allocate the whole 128 and we'll say, yep, that's what you get. Now, we don't necessarily tell the caller that that's what happened, right? We just say, yes, here is your memory that you asked for. The operating system maintains the information. It knows that the block as allocated is actually bigger than the request. Um, and um, there's no real way for the caller to know that they got more than they asked for. It's okay. Um, again, some systems round up to the nearest power of two because it helps um, in management of stuff. So we end up with you know, rounding a request for 28 bytes up to 32. Um, something like that is perfectly fine. Um, it's not, um, again, a big deal to sort of waste this and we don't tell the caller that you, know, you actually got more than you asked for. It doesn't really help um, with satisfying a large request that we uh, otherwise would not be able to do anything with but it does reduce the amount of external fragmentation, which is to say it reduces the number of entries in the linked list, which is maybe helpful. Right? Maybe it uh, makes it a little bit easier to actually iterate over things and you know, do what needs doing um, if we actually have a shorter linked list, right? It's easy. It's easy to, to see why this might be desirable. Another idea is compaction. Um, which is you know, a fancy way of saying relocation, um, but 
uh, compaction is probably a better word for it. Um, you, you can see uh, compaction is not always enjoyed by the people getting compacted. Um, so if a request for n bytes comes in, right, um, and we don't have space for it, well, maybe we could make space for it by moving things around. Does that work? Um, well, maybe. Right? The goal is to move the allocated sections of memory to be next to one another in main memory, allowing for a larger contiguous block of free space. That turns out to be an expensive operation. Um, some places you can do it. Uh, you know, Java does allow this. This is possible. Um, but Java can only do that because it has references and not pointers. And I mean, yeah, references are really just like pointers in disguise, but that's, that's a story for another time. Um, but Java knows what is a reference and what is not. It doesn't have this problem that we talked about earlier where like, ah, who knows what a pointer even is? You know, what is a piece of data? Uh, what even is this? But if Java wants to do this compaction and wants to do it completely, um, then it has to do the stop the world version of garbage collection, uh, which is halt all program execution while it reorganizes memory, making sure that it is updated every possible location, making sure that nothing has been forgotten, overlooked, left behind, you know, otherwise uh, referring to an old location when it should be referring to a new one. But as I said, even if we're willing to pay the cost, this might not be possible to do. Right, um, and I mentioned already that you know, Java will do this as, as part of the garbage collection routine, um, and that could work in Java, C Sharp, something like that, as needed when the garbage collector runs, um, but it doesn't work in, say, um, C, because, well, you know, variables are not references. Um, references are hard to identify. You know, like what's a pointer in C is, is hard to track down. Um, and there's no runtime that would uh, handle a lot of the headaches here for you. Um, and C makes it actually very difficult, um, even if you wanted to, because we do things like pointer arithmetic and using integers as addresses. So there's no reliable way to update all references, no matter how, uh, <laughs> no matter how easy it sounds um, from the perspective of you know, your product manager uh, who says things like, how hard could it be? Famous last words. Please don't say them. Okay, so yeah, given that, um, you know, we can think about one more idea um, to prevent or deal with external fragmentation, which is um, different allocation strategies. Um, and you know, given a memory request of size n, you might be asking, how do we allocate the memory? Like, where do, where does it go? So here's a map uh, showing uh, zoning for the city of Toronto. Um, and uh, I mean, as you can see, uh, things are complicated to say the least. <laughs> you know, uh, what, what counts as a residential space and what counts as like industrial and what have you. And who decides these things are like very contentious issues to begin with. But like the city of Toronto as defined uh, on this map has this concept of zoning, uh, which is to say there are different areas that are designated for different things. And you know you can't build an industrial building you know, in your backyard, no matter how much you want to, because it's not compliant with zoning rules and, and regulations. Okay, um, you know, the, things are more complicated than this in real life, of course, um, but uh, it gives us sort of some idea that if you want to, I don't know, build a, a new airport, you know, you wanted to build an airport on the east side of town, where would you put it and how would you decide where it went requires at least some strategy. Um, and so if we're gonna talk about allocation strategies, we'll start with the edge cases that are easy to discuss, which is um, if there's nowhere to put it, well, that's easy. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what strategy we use. Um, we can't fit it in, it's impossible. So we'll just admit that and we'll say yes, um, you know, no, no such, uh, no such space exists, so we're going to um, turn down the request. Similarly, if there's only one place that we could put it, there isn't really much of a decision to make, that's fine. But as long as memory has at least two free blocks of sufficient size, which is size n or more, uh, and those two blocks cannot be coalesced to make one block, we have to make a decision. Which of those is it going to be? And we're gonna examine the following strategies. One fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. No, wait, I got that wrong. Um, first fit, next fit, best fit, worst fit, quick fit. 
I'm going to try saying that faster sometime, but uh, this is this is probably not going to succeed. Um, we're going to talk about each of these strategies. They are, they are all potentially interesting in this case. Um, as a performance optimization, we'll just imagine we have two linked lists, one that contains the allocated memory and one that contains the unallocated memory. That way we don't spend time iterating over allocated memory trying to find spaces um, because that doesn't really help. But let's just start with, with this. Okay, and we'll take them in order. First fit, very easy. Uh, we start looking at the beginning of memory and we check each block. If this block is of the size that we're looking for, great, that's it. Split it to allocate the memory, return the balance to the unallocated memory list. It's very simple, it's very straightforward. You start looking at the beginning, you scan until you find what you're looking for, uh, and then you're done. So this has linear performance characteristic. We iterate over all of memory, um, all the, the free blocks, uh, to figure it out and it's as I say super simple to implement so uh, nothing to stress over we should be uh, we should be pretty comfortable with this um, and the next fit algorithm is a modification of this which is instead of starting from zero every single time instead of looking at the beginning of memory um, what we'll do is just continue from where the last block was allocated uh, and so this is potentially good for avoiding um, a lot of small unallocated blocks um, all concentrated at the start of memory. It spreads things out uh, and just potentially distributes things a little bit better um, across the available memory that we have. And then we have um, another strategy which is best fit. Uh, and that's instead of walking through the list and splitting up the um, first block that's equal to or larger than n, we're trying to find um, the smallest block that is at least as big as n. Uh, so this produces the smallest remaining unallocated space. Uh, the idea here being that we would like to you know, use the blocks that we have to their full capacity if we can do it. Uh, and so if there is a small memory allocation and there's a small space, great, we match them up. Uh, and we're not left with a lot of stuff left over if we can help it. Um, there's a couple of pro approaches to this, um, and whichever one we choose results in slightly different performance characteristics. Uh, if you need to check every single block, then it's going to be linear runtime, and we always get the worst case scenario because we literally look at every single block. Um, or we keep the blocks um, sorted by increasing size, which is linear characteristics, but we can end early. Uh, when we find the block that we're looking for. Um, potentially we could also use an AVL or red black tree uh, and we could um, potentially get uh, log n worst case behavior, uh, which would be better even than first fit. Um, but what, what we're going to do, right, is you know, keep track of the different blocks and you know, search for the one that we're looking for. And then there's worst fit and Worst fit was, uh, I won't say designed, but maybe thought up um, based on the idea that, well, listen, if we use the first fit algorithm, it's possible that like leftover bits of memory are just too small to be useful, right? We split the block and we're left with a little tiny shard of memory and that shard of memory is just so small. Are, are we ever going to have an allocation that is a good match for it? Maybe not. Um, and so rather than trying to find the smallest block that is of size n or greater, we're going to choose the largest one. Why the largest one? When the block is split, the hope is that the remaining block will be large enough to be useful, right? If, it, if it's 10 kilobytes and we you know, split it into one kilobyte and nine kilobytes, then uh, um, that's, you know, that's a useful size. You know, we could satisfy other requests using that block. Uh, whereas with first fit, if it's uh, four bytes larger than what we're looking for, you know, what are we going to do with the four bytes? Um, as with best fit, to actually implement this, we have to check each available block or keep the block sorted by size, although now we're sorting them in a different order. Um, they'll be decreasing in size this time. Um, a max heap would work. Uh, binomial or Fibonacci heap uh, could also be helpful. Um, quick fit appeared in the list. It's not really one of the uh, not really one of the options, but it is worth talking about at least a little bit. Um, and this is, well, um, just an optimization. 
If memory requests of a certain size are very common, uh, for example, requests of one megabyte, uh, it might be beneficial to sort of keep around a separate list of blocks that are one to 1.1 megabytes in size um, so that we don't have to search for uh, a memory block that meets that request. We just take the first one that is available. So let's take a look at uh, just kind of an example um, where we want to allocate 16 megabytes. Uh, and so A on, on the left here shows the before uh, with a pointer showing the last allocated block. Uh, the diagram has a, a bug in it where it says the last allocated block was 14K instead of 14M because I suspect this diagram was originally written when memory was a lot smaller uh, and received an update, but not a perfect one. And uh, what we'll do here is so consider where should the new allocations go, All right? If the request is for 16, then where do we put it? Um, so for first fit, we scan from the beginning. We'll check eight is too small, 12 is too small, 22 is big enough. So we're going to then put it in that space. So first fit allocates it there. Next fit starts at the last allocated block, checks the next one, eight megabytes, nope, too small, uh, six, too small, 14, too small, 36, that's big enough. Uh, and so it allocates it in that space, leaving a 20 megabyte space afterwards. The best fit approach is gonna consider all of those 8, 12, 22, 18, 8, 6, 14, 36. Uh, the smallest one that is still large enough to accommodate that is gonna be the 18 meg block. So that's where it is allocated, leaving two megabytes afterwards. Uh, and then worst fit is not shown on the diagram, but where would it go? Correct, it would overlap with the placement indicated for next fit because if we look at all of the blocks, the largest one is 36. Uh, and so we'll put it there, leaving the 20 meg block following it uh, as the largest available free space. Okay, what strategy should we choose? Well, I'll save you the, the trouble of uh, designing and running the simulation yourself uh, and just report to you the results that are already known. Um, and according to those simulations, well, worst fit actually performs worst in terms of time to require, uh, required to fulfill a request and results in the most wasted space. So um, if, if you had put your money on worst fit as like surprising dark horse candidate, uh, you know, uh, upset, I can't believe it, you know, pulled it uh, out of nowhere kind of success. Yeah, sorry, that, that didn't happen. Um, first fit and next fit and best fit are all about equal uh, in terms of um, how well they use memory, uh, but first fit tends to be the fastest. So yeah, sometimes simple is enough, right? Whatever gets the job done. Um, no matter what uh, optimization that we actually use, whatever we, um, whatever we try, um, we're gonna end up with about, um, well, given X allocated blocks, another half of X blocks lost to fragmentation. Um, and so this is, um, you know, the simulation is reported in one of the textbooks and it's actually um, correlated uh, and supported with the data uh, from uh, another textbook whose analysis also indicates that first fit is the best and the fastest algorithm. Um, next fit tends to break up uh, the big block of memory that's likely to be at the end. Um, but uh, best fit does indeed tend to produce blocks that are too small to be useful. So there's no perfect strategy, right? Um, it's not always, not always so simple, um, but first fit seems to be, um, we'll call it the winner. Um, so yeah, um, what about a compromise between fixed and variable allocation? Uh, we'll do just a quick sort of complex example that's intended as a compromise between fixed and variable allocation. There is in this situation some internal fragmentation, um, but it's a trade-off as we've discussed. And the system that we're gonna consider is called binary buddy. In the buddy system, memory blocks are available in powers of two, uh, which is to say that a block is of size two to the power of k, uh, where um, k is less than or equal to uh, u uh, and is greater than or equal to l. Uh, two to the power of l is the smallest block size that can be allocated, and two to the power of u is the full size of the available memory. Uh, so that's the maximum that we could ever allocate in this scenario. So initially, memory is treated as one single block, 
Uh, and if a request occurs that is uh, between the size of half of memory and all of memory, then the entire block is allocated. Otherwise, the block is split into two buddies of equal size, each representing half of memory. Um, and if the request is you know, between you know, a quarter and a half of memory, we allocate one of the halves to the request. Otherwise, we subdivide again. This makes more sense when we actually look at the visual representation, um, but I want to explain the algorithm before we, uh, before we get any further. And we'll just keep doing this until the smallest block greater than or equal to uh, this n is allocated. And in subsequent allocations, we look through our data structure to find either a block of appropriate size or a block can be subdivided to meet that allocation. Whenever a pair of buddies, um, and buddies in this case are two blocks of equal size split from the same parent, parent in quotation marks, uh, are both free, they can be coalesced. So we'll end up with something like this, right? Um, the, the one megabyte block, again, comically small, but it's sufficient for us to do the analysis that's necessary to understand the functionality here. Um, and so if there's a request of 100K, we'll start by subdividing it into two 512K blocks. Those are still bigger than we need, so we'll subdivide again. Uh, the first block into two 256k blocks. Again, still too big, so we'll subdivide the first quarter here into two 128k bytes. Uh, and then we will uh, assign the 100k to the first 128k block. Okay, that works. It's wasting some space. You know, there's 28k that's wasted in there. Um, but we have subdivided uh, to the point where we can't divide anymore. Uh, and then for request for 240K, um, that fits in the 256K block that we already have. So let's just put it there. Uh, our request for uh, 64K results in subdividing the 128K block. We choose that one because it has the, the fewest subdivisions necessary to achieve what we want. Uh, and a request for 256, um, results in another uh, subdivision of the right side here uh, to accommodate this 256k. Okay, uh, and then we have some you know, deallocations here. So we're going to deallocate um, the B memory allocation, um, which was the 256k. So that one's just marked as free. We cannot coalesce it because although it's got a neighbor 64k that is free, um, they're not buddies, right? They're not blocks of the same size from a common parent, uh, and therefore we can't coalesce them together. All right, moving on. We'll release A, uh, and this results in, um, again, no change. Uh, we can't coalesce it, we can't do anything with it. Uh, we will request 75K. That goes in the space where A was previously allocated because we can fulfill that request without having to uh, split any blocks and it's an appropriate size, so we're happy with that. Uh, deallocation of C does finally result in a coalescence in the example um, where we have deallocated um, 64K. It's got a buddy that was split from the same parent, so those two are combined to produce the 128K block. Uh, and uh, we can't coalesce any further because its neighbor is not uh, a buddy. And then when we release um, E, um, this results in a coalescence here. The 128K is coalesced with its neighbor. Uh, and then we have two equal 256 blocks that came from the same parent. So we will coalesce them as well. Uh, and when we do so, um, we have just the one allocation there of D uh, and another 256K. Uh, and then finally, uh, to round out the example, we deallocate uh, D. Uh, and when we do so, right, we coalesce the two 256K blocks on that side, uh, and we have two equal 512K blocks, which we will coalesce back to the uh, original one megabyte block uh, that we started with. So overall, um, this gives a fairly uh, thorough example of what's actually going on uh, when we use the binary buddy system. Is it interesting to talk about? Yes. Uh, is it practical? Um, is it something that we're going to actually sort of talk about uh, when we're you know, implementing a real operating system? Probably not anymore, um, but it is still kind of a neat thing to think about as a way of um, how do we potentially allocate memory.
So when we come back to the next topic, we're going to talk about memory segmentation and paging uh, as we sort of build our way through memory to uh, the, the real version of you know, what a modern operating system would actually use. So we'll stop here for now uh, and continue in the next topic.